Hello and welcome back to this series on post-Restoration Ireland, where I've been covering the fortunes of the Stuart monarchs of England, as well as the relationship that Ireland's Catholic population had to them. I have to apologise before we start for the lengthy gap between this episode and the last, as I write this an ominous one month ago looms under the last upload in this series. With the lifting of lockdown and the resumption of my studies, I suddenly have a lot less time on my hands. Work or no work, though, I do intend to continue uploading videos on this channel, as it's something that I enjoy, and from the comments it seems like you guys have been enjoying it too, which I'm happy to see. With that out of the way, we can pick up from where we left off, with the arrival of James II in Dublin in March of 1689, fresh from his brief exile in France. The deposed king was received with much pomp and ceremony upon his arrival. A flag flew from Dublin Castle emblazoned with the motto, now or never, now and forever, which I feel is such a stirring phrase it belongs in a movie of some kind. James had come to Ireland in the hopes that he could use the kingdom as a springboard from which he could launch an invasion of England and reclaim his throne. Ireland's Catholic population were willing enough to help him achieve this. In the closing years of James's time on the throne of England, he had gifted Catholic Ireland with a great many privileges and put a firm stop to the Protestant ascendancy which had been gathering pace. Those Irish who were loyal to James knew that in order to maintain what they had gained, the exile king needed to win his war with the usurper, William of Orange. Before any move could be made against England, though, James needed to ensure that his power base in Ireland was rock solid. The presence of towns and garrisons that professed loyalty to William was a crease that needed to be ironed out. James's first target was the town of Londonderry, or Derry, depending on who you ask today. He was confident that he could take the town with ease, as the army set aside for the task was 25,000 strong, and a traitor within the walls of the town was primed to turn the place over to James's men. The traitor within the walls was none other than the garrison commander, a man by the name of Lundy. Ahead of James's arrival, Lundy managed to divert two regiments of English troops intended for the defence of the town by making up false assignments for them that would come to nothing. All was then ready for a quick and easy seizure of the place. The Jacobite army arrived at Londonderry on April 19th and were surprised to find the gates closed to them. On closer inspection, citizens of the town could be seen manning the walls. The inhabitants of Londonderry must have gotten wind of what Lundy was planning, and dealt with him. The cry from the walls was, famously, no surrender. There were many French officers in James's army which had been lent to him in order to give his forces a professional backbone. These same officers claimed that the walls of the town would not be held for more than two days. The people manning them were, after all, just armed civilians. The French officers were forced to eat their words over the coming days, as assault after assault was repelled by the inhabitants of the town. In the first weeks of June, James was beginning to get impatient. He decided to push for a decisive attack on the walls, casualties be damned. For a time it looked as though his troops really would gain mastery of the place, but eventually they were pushed back to their camp, just as they had been before. It is said that in this final assault on the walls, the women of Londonderry came out to defend the town alongside their husbands and sons. Following this defeat, James was forced to give up on taking the town by assault. It was simply too costly. Instead, he chose to blockade the town by land and sea and starve the defenders out. Hunger began to bite quickly, but still the inhabitants did not offer their surrender. Eventually, on July 28th, an English fleet under Kirk managed to break its way through James's blockade and raise the siege. It had lasted 105 days. Following the debacle at Londonderry, James retired to Dublin in order to get his administration in order. While he and his battered army rested, news of more defeats at the hands of Williamite forces filtered in. The men of Enniskillen, for example, managed to see off the Jacobite forces at the Battle of Newton Butler. James had other problems, though, and he could not afford to neglect them. The most pressing of these problems was his severe lack of funds. The army needed to be paid. Even the vested interest his troops had in his victory could only take him so far. To tackle this issue, 
James decided on a common enough but almost always bad decision. He issued a heavily debased new coin, which could be used to pay his armies in the field. This debasement had an effect of more or less forcing a pay cut on his troops. This seems like a poor choice to me from a leader who had not yet won a single battle. The debasement of the coinage would be remembered for years by the citizens of Dublin with extreme distaste. There were, of course, grumblings in the army as well, but for the most part, Irish Catholics appear to have been happy to continue to support James. This was for the obvious reasons I mentioned in my previous video, but also due to the session of the Irish Parliament of May 1689, where James had passed a number of radical new changes. This Parliament session had been composed mostly of Gaelic Irish and Old English, which was unusual in the extreme all by itself. In addition to this, the interests of both groups were for the first time fully aligned. The first proposed vote was on the notorious Acts of Settlement. The acts were promptly repealed, and an act of attainder was then passed against roughly 2,500 people, who were supposedly partisans of William. Finally, and most radically, an act was passed that declared the Irish Parliament to be free from the influence of laws passed at Westminster. This was the most significant change of the whole session, and was met with raucous approval by the great and the good of Catholic Irish society. Returning to the narrative where we left it, William of Orange had not been idle while James rested his forces in Dublin. An English army was landed on the shores of County Down, with the aim of once again subduing the island. The force was led by a veteran named Schomburg, and his army numbered about the same as the force Cromwell had brought years before. Unlike Cromwell's army, though, Schomburg's force was composed chiefly of freshly raised soldiers, though it was not without seasoned veterans. The campaign was instantly less successful than Cromwell's which had preceded it. Rather than make a decapitating strike at Dublin, Schoenberg elected to advance cautiously southwards from Carrickfergus. James's army was still recovering from its defeats at Londonderry and Enishkillen, and was not in peak fighting condition by any means, so Schoenberg's caution was probably unwarranted. The slow pace of Schoenberg's advance likely prevented him from being ambushed or similarly inconvenienced but it gave the difficult country and turbulent weather ample opportunity to go to work on his men. The attrition rate was so high that Schoenberg was forced to halt before reaching Dundalk, 50 miles from Dublin, in order to take up winter quarters. This pause was necessary to preserve the remains of Schoenberg's force, but gave James plenty of time to fill the ranks of his army with new troops, who, while inexperienced, were not lacking in enthusiasm. In addition to this, Louis of France finally consented to send some more tangible military aid to James, and sailed 7,000 professional French troops over to Ireland to stiffen the resolve of the Jacobite army. The arrival of such a large amount of French troops in Ireland naturally had the effect of escalating the conflict, and meant that William was obliged to take a more direct role in affairs. In June 1690, the King of England arrived at Carrickfergus at the head of 36,000 men. The army was incredibly diverse, and clearly demonstrated the European nature of the war between James and William. Amongst the ranks of the newly arrived army were Englishmen, Danes, Brandenburgers, Dutch, Germans, and French Huguenots. William, like Schoenberg before him, chose not to make directly for Dublin. However, he advanced much more quickly than Schoenberg had the previous year, and his troops reached the banks of the River Boyne on June 3rd, as evening drew in. James was of course kept up to date on his rival's movements. His French advisers were wary of engagement with so large a force, given that only the mixed French and Irish cavalry had real battlefield experience. William had a clear advantage in both quality and quantity of soldiers. The bulk of James's army was composed of fresh and inexperienced troops, and would need a strong position to hold its ground against the advance of William's multi-ethnic force. Ultimately it was decided that William would be halted at the Boyne, where one of the most famous battles in Irish history would be fought. On the 1st of July, James's 30,000 strong army faced down the oncoming army of William of Orange. O'Connor gives us an account of how the lines were set up. He says, and I quote, The position of James was strong against a direct attack. A broad and deep river ran before his front, and his reserves were thrown back out of sight of the enemy. 
but a narrow defile at Dulic, near his rear, was almost his only avenue of retreat. On the day of the battle, James elected to post his French contingent at the defile to ensure that it remained open to him should his army need to withdraw. This was sound strategy in one sense, as the professional French troops could be relied upon to stay at their posts and keep the avenue of retreat open even if things were falling apart around them. On the other hand, the removal of the French to the defile meant that James's front line boasted far fewer veteran troops than it otherwise would have done. This fact would tell almost straight away when the battle began. William seized the initiative on July 1st, and sent a contingent forward under Schomburg's son to threaten the left of the Irish line. This also threatened the defile at Dulic, and this was what made up James's mind to send the French troops to their posts there. Meanwhile, William sent his main thrust across a ford in the river near the village of Oldbridge. The Irish troops stationed there were sorely lacking in professional backbone, and began to buckle quickly. The field was soon littered with bodies, and fleeing troops streamed back towards the reserves. James's cavalry were professional soldiers, and it showed. They performed far better than their counterparts in the infantry, and continuously saw off Danes, Huguenots, and Englishmen. Schomburg himself was killed in an engagement with the Irish cavalry, but this seems to have had little effect on the overall cohesion of William's army. Eventually, the Irish cavalry were forced to retire as well, as William brought more forces to bear on them that had been freed up as the Jacobite army fled towards Dulic. The only silver lining for James was that the French troops had indeed remained at their post, and kept the retreat corridor open long enough for the remains of the army to retreat in something resembling good order. James himself escaped the field unharmed, and saw fit to continue retreating until he arrived in France, abandoning the thousands of men who had staked all their hopes on him. William, meanwhile, marched triumphantly into Dublin and swept aside the administration of his vanquished rival, much to the adultation of the city's Protestant population. The conflict in Ireland was not over yet, though. There would be a lot more blood before the kingdom would be peaceful once again. The events following the Boyne and the eventual conclusion of the conflict before the walls of Limerick will have to wait until next time. I'd like to say thank you to you all again for your patience while I got myself organized for this video. I unfortunately can't make any guarantees about a consistent upload schedule with my workload at the moment, but I'll try to put out videos at a reasonable pace if I can. You can email me with questions at keanrowanyt at gmail.com or leave me a comment on this video. Thank you for listening.